uh, hopefully I can um, I, I can highlight some of the incredible contributions he's making to you know tectonics, earth science, uh, and so on. So today um, I'll be talking about uh, these global scale uh, landscape evolution models uh, through time over the last hundred million years, and what they can tell us uh, about uh, sediment fluxes uh, and and how it can reconcile some of these um, uh, controversies or paradoxes in in the geological uh, record. So I'll start with a little bit of background, um, particularly when we talk about you know Earth's deep time uh, landscapes. Um, of course, they're really important to constrain because uh, they're key inputs to paleoclimate models, um, ocean at, and atmospheric circulation, of course. Uh, the evolutionary biologists love these sorts of models because they're, they're useful for understanding the uh, biogeographic dispersal of plants and animals. And of course, for industry, it's it's very useful because you know they they might be interested in okay where where might ore deposits be formed, but then uh, where are they preserved? Uh, if there's too much erosion, well, you might be destroying uh, that ore deposit. But the way they're typically constructed is uh, on these essentially tectonic uh, base maps, uh, and on top of that, you overlay some proxies or indicators of paleo environments. Um, it could be fossils, you know, in the marine realm, uh, and 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 so on. And then you you infer the paleo elevation, and this is still quite tricky of constraining. Well, you know, what was the elevation of the Andes or or Tibet uh, 50 million years ago? And and those two examples are probably one of the better studies with lots of paleo altimetry estimates that have come out from the uh, incredible um, uh, geomorphology. Uh, discipline. So here is an example of these paleogeographic maps, and uh, I used the Geoscience Australia Paleogeographic Atlas of Australia as well uh, as as an example. And the reason is that I'm I'm a big fan. To me, it's it's the gold standard uh, in the way that it's implemented because uh, it provides you with the data input. So this is an example for the Devonian, say about 400 million years ago. So there's the data and then there's the interpretation. Oh, and of course you can see where there's extrapolation uh, and, and so on. But you know it, it helps us um, figure out where, where there's constraints and where more data collection uh, is needed. And of course we can add more data. you know these are uh, fossil marine fossil occurrences and and perhaps we can say maybe maybe there was um, a, a bit more um, uh, of an inundated shelf running through here at the time. So that's how these things built. But you can see like these brown regions essentially indicate, well, an erosional setting. It doesn't really tell us about the paleo uh, elevations. So that's, that's, um, that is tricky. And um, I, I think there's uh, a lot of work still needed to uh, improve these things. But a lot of the work that I do is in that tectonics, geodynamics domain in, in deep time. These are the sort of plate reconstructions um, I've been involved in making. And there you can see, well, orange are your mountains, uh, yellow are the emergent land masses, light blue are the um, uh, continental shelves and so on, or flooded continental uh, regions, right? So, you know, it, it's quite coarse. And, and I, I guess I wanted to show you uh, you know the, the state of 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 the art in in paleogeography uh, that's quite uh, well a, a data constrained at, at least in most places. And then when it comes to using uh, you know um, uh, paleo elevations or elevations uh, to infer you know the past inundation uh, or uh, erosion patterns. This is just an example of what, you know, a lot of us have done in the past, you know, very crude stuff, which is, well, you've got a sea level curve. This is for the last 20,000 years uh, for Southeast Asia. That's the present day. And of course, 20,000 years ago, um, most of Sunderland was uh, emergent. And of course, as uh, we leave the last glacial maximum, uh, there's flooding and this, you know, uh, Sunda landmass becomes dissected by very shallow uh, seas. Uh, and, and this is very simplistic because it's just kind of filling the bathtub. It, it ignores all the exciting processes uh, that geomorphologists are interested in, like erosion, deposition, and, and so on. 
And so Tristan Sal is uh, the, the the guru in um, in in creating these uh, uh, digital uh, community tools of modeling landscape evolution on long uh, timescales. And 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 this is um, a, a paper that was published uh, 20, uh, last year uh, that was looking essentially at the evolution of Sunderland in the last 500,000 years. Uh, it incorporates uh, rainfall uh, and therefore also erosion. And then you can see the river networks uh, evolving. You can see here in these colors, um, the uh, drainage basins, which is really cool. One can actually uh, uh, you know, look at, at that uh, in detail, I guess that whole source to sink system. Uh, and for this paper, uh, Tristan and, and the rest of us, we were looking at uh, the landscape connectivity uh, from these uh, landscape pollution models. And, and so you can see these you know, areas of high connectivity and you can link that to, well, perhaps um, biogeographic dispersal of certain species uh, in, in those uh, niches. So, so it gives you an idea of, of okay, so, so the, the um, advances that, that uh, Tristan has made, and of course there have been lots of other people um, making these uh, tools as well. And uh, Tristan has also uh, created a tool called Pi Badlands. Uh, it's a, so it's a Python based tool um, and it runs, cur well, currently it runs on a single uh, core. Uh, and, and so a landscape evolution model of say the whole Australian continent are over 150 uh, million years at a resolution of 50 kilometers it, it takes about one hour to run. And, and I mean, that, that's, that's fantastic for us because we can, we can run dozens and dozens of these models uh, and test things like, uh, you know, dynamic topography from mantle convection, uh, different sea level curves, uh, different elastic thicknesses uh, of, of the plate uh, in terms of how it accommodates uh, sedimentation, uh, the er erodibility, uh, of of the geology uh, and of course we can test different precipitation or climate scenarios and so this is really you know incredible for me um, because I, I, the landscape uh, becomes uh, alive in these deep time uh, models we can look at the the paleo coastline um, evolution but particularly we were interested in uh, the uh, flooding of eastern australia uh, the aramanga sea uh, and what you can see is there's a mid Cretaceous flooding event, um, perhaps a bit similar to the Western Interior Seaway in, in the US. Uh, there was a Cordillera system uh, along Eastern Australia uh, and that collapsed from about a hundred million years ago. So uh, it's really incredible that we can capture this evolution, uh, but importantly, the, the, these models capture the erosion and deposition of the sediments uh, as well. Uh, and so we can interrogate those models. Uh, and uh, Tristan has this wonderful open community uh, philosophy of essentially making the the code available, open source. Uh, if you don't have the time to compile it yourself, he puts it into these uh, very convenient Docker environments. Uh, and if that's not uh, good enough, you know, he has a very extensive, detailed documentation and uh, or many, many Jupyter um, uh, notebooks examples of how to do uh, everything so it, I mean it's just to, to, to me it's transformational in terms of uh, paleogeography and so what it allowed us to do was run about 60 models and this was done uh, by Carmen Braz uh, a, a master student and here we just are showing four models um, uh, uh, through time so from 150 MA to present different snapshots key snapshots and you can see really that M4 uh, this column, uh, the preferred model, um, does best in reproducing the flooding of the Aramanga uh, Sea. Uh, and here we were testing different sea level curves and dynamic uh, topography models. Uh, and you can see that, well, model four is, is the most promising uh, and it gives us an insight into, well, you know, which combination of parameters, you know, the sea level curve uh, and the dynamic topography model uh, makes the most sense. And, and, and I think that's really quite powerful. And of course, we can compare that to the uh, paleogeographic atlas uh, for Australia. Uh, and be, because these are digital models, we can interrogate them. So uh, at the bottom left here 
is a cross section, east west cross section through the Great Artesian Basin. Uh, and so we have sediment thicknesses of about two kilometers. Okay. And these are the four models. <clears throat> and you can say, well, you know, all four models do really well in generally predicting two kilometer thickness of sediments. So they're all uh, uh, really good. But in fact, when we, when you take these kind of, you know, pseudo wells, synthetic wells through um, these two locations, you can see again that, that model four does much better in uh, reproducing those marine environments in the Aramanga uh, uh, Sea. And that, that's all extracted from uh, the Badlands models. And I, I know Shu Song uh, is, is in the audience and I, I know she's done some uh, wonderful work with, with uh, Badlands too. Now, um, so, so that's Badlands and that's the, the kind of continental scale regional models that have been done. And so uh, Tristan being Tristan is, uh, you know, there are no limits for what, what the guy can do. You know, he's essentially gone uh, global, right? And so um, currently the gold standard is the paleo map, paleo geographies from uh, Chris Cotiz. And they are, they cover the whole Phanerozoic, which is fantastic. Uh, they have, um, so Chris has been very generous to release uh, the paleo uh, DEMs at 0 0.1 degree resolution at about five to 10 million year intervals. Uh, and that's available uh, on Zenodo. And, and these are used across industry and academia. And the great thing is more recently, um, Chris had uh, teamed up with uh, Paul Valdez at Bristol University who ran lots of uh, paleoclimate models. And so we, we get ad additional layers. Uh, so in our case, we were very interested in the precipitation uh, history because, well, that's one of the key uh, things that go into uh, landscape evolution models. Uh, uh, stream power law, uh, slopes and so on, and, and the erosion that uh, ensues. Now, the scientific questions that you can address with this sort of global landscape pollution model is, well, you know, what are the implied sediment fluxes to the oceans from uh, these paleo uh, DEMs? How much sediment might be stored on continents? Uh, and how much and when uh, are sediments remobilized from the continents to the ocean basins or the continental margins? Um, and, and how does actually one create these continuously evolving landscapes that, you know, they, they look like they're breathing, living, breathing things? Uh, and how can we test them with uh, data uh, and constraints? Uh, and uh, of course, uh, more local or regional scales, well, what are the catchment dynamics over deep time scales? Uh, and in other words, if, if we look at, for example, Gondwana, right, there were mega rivers that were, uh, seem to have been uh, crossing Antarctica and Australia. Uh, and so these global landscape pollution models can, can do um, uh, a, a lot of really interesting things. So for example, um, in, in Sydney, we have the famous Hawkesbury uh, sandstone and the zircon history suggests that maybe it actually, uh, the sediments originated all the way from Antarctica uh, and, and, and so you have these sketches, but these sorts of landscape evolution models can help um, uh, constrain and test these scenarios. So this is what led Tristan then to develop Gospel, which is this global uh, scale landscape evolution model. Uh, it is really cool because first of all, it's also open source, uh, but it's also parallelized, right? So it doesn't just run on a single core. It's very easy to deploy on, you know, your supercomputer or if you have multiple cores on your machines. And you can see there's lots of documentation that Tristan has uh, prepared. Uh, oops. Um, uh, and uh, and there's, yeah, uh, Docker um, uh, environments, uh, lots of tutorials and just incredible documentation that allows you to fully reproduce uh, uh, everything and then also apply to your own uh, research, which I just think is, is such a cool philosophy. I, I, I love it. Now, uh, yeah, so the uh, the Scotese paleo map, uh, uh, paleo DEMs, they underpin many aspects of, of the paleo earth system modeling, right? So uh, I mentioned climate models um, and evolution of, of life. 
So uh, they're used across different communities uh, and they're, they're treated as, as truth and they're treated as truth because really we have nothing uh, better. It is the state of the art. Um, but as more data is emerging, it's really good to know where uh, the models can be improved. And, and, and I think that this landscape uh, evolution modeling um, uh, can help. So the idea is essentially that you, you have, okay, you have a paleo DM uh, at 10 million year intervals uh, on average, right? And you want to capture the landscape evolution uh, between those two time steps. So the first thing is that you need to actually displace the surface with the tectonics, right? Uh, laterally, okay? Uh, and then uh, you can apply uh, with all the precipitation from the Valdez climate models. And so you erode the surface, but then you might get to the next time step and realize, well, actually there's a huge mismatch. I've eroded the mountains too much. And so one can then apply the necessary tectonic uplift to, to create a smooth and evolving uh, model uh, of that surface. And once you've got that, then you can track uh, well, you can track the erosion. These are the blue colors uh, and then the deposition of sediments through time and the accumulation of, of those sediments. So you can get the de denudation and the uh, sedimentation history, which is, I, I, it's just, it's just mind blowing to me, you know, coming from the tectonics uh, community. It's just so, so cool. So um, essentially it's an iterative uh, process, you know, uh, you, you run the model uh, forward in time, you compute the mismatches and, and go back. Uh, and it, it's kind of this um, uh, uh, adjoint almost um, modeling uh, approach. And I, I think um, it's best to just demonstrate for the next uh, few slides, uh, which is essentially that uh, what you do is, well, you, you start uh, with, with uh, your um, T1, your initial time, uh, you reconstruct forward in time uh, and apply your surface uh, uh, process modeling, right? The erosion uh, and, and deposition given the, the climate, the precipitation that you have. And then you can look at the, um, uh, uh, the correlation uh, with, with the end result. Uh, and then the the difference, the mismatch as well. So there's uh, so this is for example highlighting uh, what the the mismatch uh, can be, right? It can be uh, hundreds of meters. So we can ignore the ocean oceanic region regions, really focused on the continental uh, uh, regions here. Um, and one of the things that we want to do is when we take into account the mismatch is, well, we, we actually want to filter out the uh, high frequency uh, topographic signal from uh, the, you know, the river, rivers and the fluvial networks. And we want to be able to compare like with like, you know, this, the SCOT 0.1 degree resolution with um, essentially 0.1 degree resolution uh, equivalent from the uh, landscape evolution prediction. Uh, and you you do that iteratively uh, and and adjust the tectonic uplift and subsidence in places, uh, and uh, you get a much lower uh, mismatch. Uh, and and so I'll show you uh, in the next slides um, how uh, one actually decides well what is what uh, what conditions are enough uh, to satisfy uh, uh, this. So so okay so here is. Um, uh, the landscape evolution model. There's the mismatch. Uh, and you can see uh, this number here represents the uh, correlation, okay, uh, between the, the uh, predicted landscape uh, and what the Scotis paleo map is telling you. And then uh, here uh, is it's saying that 47% of the mesh nodes have a mismatch of greater than 100 meters in elevation. And so you can iterate and you can see that the correlation can improve uh, and your mismatch decreases. And the threshold is essentially once we have less than 10% uh, difference where we're quite happy. 
uh, uh, with, with the model. So you, you, you can essentially, it might be a bit hard to see, but the landscape evolution models add a lot more detail in terms of uh, the fluvial networks uh, that we don't have in the, um, the paleo map, paleogeographic um, uh, project, right? And, and so it, it provides these very high resolution globally uh, physiographic maps at 10 kilometer resolution. And because you can uh, spread this across multiple processes, you can really, uh, I mean, I mentioned to you the um, Australian continental scale model. We were running that at um, 50 kilometer resolution. So essentially uh, uh, Tristan has managed to, uh, you know, increase the resolution by five times uh, and spread the load across many, many processes. And it's just, it's, to me, it's just incredible. Uh, and, and so then you, you can get a new paleo elevation model that has a lot more detail. Um, you, you can see the tectonics here uh, and you'll be able to see a lot more incision uh, and a lot more detail um, uh, in, in the landscapes, right? And what you'll notice is that there are times where, uh, well, you know, continents are colliding. There may be uh, intracratonic uh, uh, internally draining uh, continental basins uh, through time. And of course, there's, you know, the Alpine Tethys Himalayan uh, belt uh, uplifting the last 50 million years. <clears throat> so you can interrogate these models just like the Badlands models, and you can see in blue. Uh, are the river networks that are predicted <clears throat> in, uh, in these darker blues, you can actually predict where you might have uh, lakes. Uh, but of course, that that um, probably needs a bit more constraints uh, from the paleoclimate models in terms of that balance between evaporation um, uh, and uh, an accumulation of water. Um, so you get the drainage basins, the rivers, uh, and you know their longitude longitudinal profiles, you can look at nick, nick points, nick zone migration and so on. And here is just an example of uh, the uh, sediment, um, well, the accumulative erosion and deposition. So um, you, you can have, well, in, in this case, um, uh, about five kilometers of, of uh, deposition. And you can interrogate these models, make lots of cross sections um, and extract uh, all sorts of things, the, the layer thicknesses, but even things like the uh, modeled porosities uh, and even um, N member um, uh, 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 grain, grain size distributions. Here is an example uh, for the model run uh, from 100 uh, million years ago to the present. Uh, and in the different gray shading, it's just different uh, uh, drainage basins. So these are, I believe, yeah, these are the 50 largest. Uh, drainage basins, and then the colored are the um, uh, rivers, uh, water fluxes from uh, the largest hundred uh, rivers uh, through time. Okay, so you can track that uh, through time. And at the present day, these correspond quite well in black dots. This is the present day measured uh, uh, most significant uh, rivers. I think about 200 of them or so. And then these are all the modeled uh, rivers from the gospel models. Okay, so there's a, it's a very nice uh, uh, correlation uh, there. But importantly, what's, what we were interested in is looking at the sediment flux uh, through time. Okay, so this is from about 95 million years ago to the present. And um, uh, this is the total a sediment uh, a flux. Uh, and these are the different contributions from, well, the subtropical regions, the temperate uh, and polar uh, regions. Okay, so, well, and, and what's really quite interesting is that there seems to be an increase uh, in uh, sedimentation the last, say, 15 million years to the oceans. Okay, and that, that's, that's quite curious. And that's, um, uh, uh, yeah, really interesting. In terms of, uh, doing sanity checks on, on these models because you know you need to also have an erodibility uh, uh, coefficient. Um, in orange, uh, so this is for the orange uh, river uh, delta uh, and, and, and this is the sediment volume uh, through time from here. Uh, 
in green is the measured, uh, reconstructed, I guess, from the geological record. And in orange is the simulated um, uh, sediment volume uh, accumulation. So, so the models are, are, are doing uh, quite well uh, in, in reproducing the, the, the history. Uh, they do uh, really interesting things because uh, you can also compare the predicted uh, sediment thicknesses. So this is the Salado Basin, uh, Pilotas Basin um, uh, here. This is the prediction from the gospel models. Um, I, I believe, yeah, this is the uh, cross section here. Um, and this is the seismic uh, uh, interpretation as well. So th th there's a lot of uh, similarity. And given that these are global models that haven't really been calibrated all that much, particularly not for the um, continental shelves. Uh, it's, it's really, I think, to me, quite spectacular. It also does highlight in places where there are mismatches. So there is an erosional um, uh, surface here, whereas in, in, in the models, it actually suggests, uh, you know, preserved sedimentation. So it, it just gives us clues as to where the paleo DMs, um, uh, you know, need to actually be uh, improved. Uh, so that, that's that's one of the ways that we can actually test those paleo map, uh, paleo DMs. So that's really, really cool. Uh, and then when, whoops, when we look at the um, sediment accumulation, <clears throat> different basins. So uh, Australia, this is, uh, I guess, the Lake Air Basin, the Great Artesian Basin. And we get about a kilometer of uh, sedimentation in the last 100 million years, which is uh, on par with the, um, uh, the, the geological record. Uh, and you can see here, this is the India-Eurasia collision zone. There's a lot of accumulation uh, north of Tibet um, in, in some of these basins like Tarim and, and, and so on. And a lot of, of course, sediment accumulation in the um, Bengal fan, uh, perhaps a little bit less uh, uh, projected for the Indus uh, fan. <clears throat> now, when we look at the continental versus marine uh, sedimentation, is it, it's really quite interesting because what the models predict is that for some time, uh, say in parts of the Eocene, uh, you had a lot more sediment accumulation uh, on the continents, within the continents, right? Uh, and, and it was much more than the uh, marine uh, sedimentation, right? Uh, but but in the last 25 million years, uh, what, what's what's really interesting is that a lot of those continental um, sediment accumulations, well, they're diminishing and many are being eroded and remobilized, uh, and there's a lot more uh, marine uh, sedimentation. And this is really uh, quite important because this has been discussed. Uh, in a lot of literature in the past, which is essentially saying, well, from the mass of sediment uh, through time that has been catalogued, I mean, it, this is a fairly uh, old uh, synthesis from 1988, but it does say that, well, okay, in the last 25 million years, there's been a lot more uh, sediment flux uh, uh, to, to the margins of the, of the continents. And that, uh, that might, imply, well, maybe there was a lot more tectonism um, occurring and, you know, lots more mountain building. Um, but, but really from the geology, uh, from the tectonic reconstructions, there's not a lot of evidence. If anything, it, it suggests there's maybe a, a slight slowdown in the uh, crustal production rate. Uh, and if we look at the uh, subducting plate area through time in the last uh, 25 million years, you know, it's, it's essentially gone down. It hasn't gone up. So in terms of that proxy for tectonic activity, uh, there's, it seems to be that there's less uh, tectonism. And then uh, from a climate perspective, well, we, we were all aware of the um, oxygen isotope record that suggests, well, you know, cooling, uh, and, and if there's cooling, well, perhaps the hydro hydrological cycle uh, is is not as intense, and perhaps there's uh, you know less uh, erosion. So it doesn't quite explain why 
um, there is so much more sedimentation. But these models, these global landscape evolution models that Tristan has developed and deployed, essentially, I think, help reconcile this paradox, which is essentially it's saying that um, a lot of the continentally stored uh, sediments have have been remobilized uh, and shed uh, and, and deposited onto the margins. And so it just highlights uh, to me um, that, that's something that wasn't obvious just by looking at the paleo DEMs, but by looking at the drainage evolution, the you know, um, sediment accumulations and so on, um, it, it's really helped us um, uh, understand this, this, this problem and this process a lot more. So uh, it, it essentially is leading towards the development of these, you know, um, deep time digital twins of our planet, uh, where you can capture things like basin accumulation um, uh, through time, exhumation rates. You can tie that or, or uh, link that to the fossil records and create these new, very high resolution uh, and better constrained paleogeographic maps that can be used uh, by the community. And just to give you an idea, uh, in Gospel, you can even uh, track the different uh, end member um, uh, lithologies in terms of the uh, grain size uh, distribution uh, and also track things like uh, porosity uh, and, and so on. So they're really um, quite powerful tools. I, I, I find them just um, in, incredible. And um, so essentially the longer term um, uh, aim uh, of what we're doing is is to bring in a, 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 and create kind of a whole earth model. So currently we have everything except the core of, of planet earth, you know, uh, the inner and outer core, but but uh, from the mantle convection models, we have, we, we can assume, you know, the core mantle boundary temperatures, we can um, extract the mantle uh, flow fields, we can uh, have the rigid and deforming plate tectonic reconstructions on the surface, um, creating these paleogeographic uh, maps uh, that, that are linked to paleoclimate and they can also be lo looked uh, and explored in the context of biodiversity uh, and um, biogeographic um, uh, dispersal. So really quite powerful and as I mentioned, community tools um, that that I, I think are groundbreaking. So uh, I'm really excited that I, I got to present this on behalf of, of Tristan. Um, if if I've messed something up, um, uh, I think Beatrice is is also here, uh, co-author. She can help clarify. Uh, and luckily, Tristan is on a plane right now, so you know he can't he can't uh, you know uh, <laughs> correct me live. But uh, if there's any questions, please feel free to reach out um, uh, to Tristan or myself. And um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's it for me. I'm happy uh, to take uh, any questions. Brilliant! Thank you so much. That was super interesting and amazing to see all of these tools available <laughs> to be used. It kind of like a playground. You want to start straight away. Um, I guess while the chat is now open for questions, everyone, so um, feel free to write in there, or you can um, raise your hand or write in the chat that you want to to talk directly. Um, well, we've got some examples of yeah of the Jupiter. Is, that's right. It's it's just running in Docker right now. Um, the Jupiter uh, notebook, uh, and you can see that um, uh, yeah, the, the the source code and um, so there's notebooks in here, um, uh, different models, and you just launch launch the Jupiter notebook and go through. Um, and yeah, you 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 get results in you know an hour or so. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's some really cool tools that, that can be used. That's brilliant. Um, so there's no questions straight away, but I will go ahead and and ask mine. Um, I know you were talking about um, how there's a lot of kind of sedimentological data that suggests that um, sedimentation rates have been increasing through time. Um, and obviously that was um, going against what the model predicted. I know um, there's also the, this, um, I think it's Sadler's observation that um, mm. as you go through time, you know, you're, you're starting to average time periods where maybe there's more erosional hiatuses. 
Um, and I was wondering if that's something that the model could probe, um, kind of, if that's something that's been thought of. Or... Yeah. yeah, look, uh, absolutely. I, I, I did talk um, to Tristan about the Sadler effect. I, I hadn't actually heard about it because, you know, I'm from the tectonics field, but <laughs> we had an interesting discussion there. And, and yeah, because these models are um, time evolving, you can really in interrogate them. You can track the erosional surfaces uh, uh, through time. You can track the remobilization of, of sediments and the kind of biases in, in terms of the preservation. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I think a lot can be done. Uh, and, and this is essentially the initial uh, first I guess deployment of, of the models. So I, I think there's yeah a lot, a lot more that can be done. That's really fascinating. And I was wondering if there was um, any studies that have kind of compared, say, the results of this kind of global um, modeling with maybe more local modeling, like of the drainage network or, or something like that. Are there any yeah. studies that exist or? Yeah. So um, well, look, this global uh, model it's just been submitted, right? I can see the. <laughs> The, the, the co-authors uh, here. So it's, it's just submitted, but what I've done is, is I, I have cross-checked it with, you know, for example, our model uh, for Australia using uh, the other code, um, uh, Badlands and cross-checking that to, to the Geoscience Australia data. And it, it works quite well. Um, in, in terms of the total sediment thicknesses um, from like the globe said model as well, uh, it, we, we under predict the total thicknesses, but that's actually to be expected because we only run the model for the last 100 million years, whereas Glob said is probably capturing the last 200 million years. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I think, you know, generally, globally, uh, and in many regions, uh, the results are really quite promising. Amazing. Okay. Um, so we have a question from Beatrice. Um, so I will ask her to unmute and then uh, should be able to go ahead. I have a question I can ask later to Sabine or I can ask now. Uh, just just to let you know, because the chat's not actually open, still disabled. Oh. So I'm not sure. Yeah, so I'm not sure if people are trying to ask. Okay, should be... My question <laughs> would be, what would be the main difference between Badlands and Gospel? Mm -hmm. But if someone else has a different question, they, sure. they can come first. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a great question, Beatrice. Um, so the, the main difference is, well, Badlands is Cartesian. So it's really um, suited for regional studies. Whereas Gospel is, is global and spherical. So it is, it is for global applications. Um, because you can parallelize it, you can really dramatically in, increase the resolution um, in in gospel. Whereas on on Badlands, you 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 know limited essentially to to one uh, CPU at a time. Badlands can can still be very useful because you can run lots of batched um, uh, models running uh, simultaneously. Badlands does at the moment have probably a little bit more sophisticated handling of of flexure uh, and you know the the response of loading and unloading of, of sediments uh, and and yeah badlands is is got some more um, um, modules you know wave modules carbonate uh, module and, and so on but 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 knowing Tristan you know um, um, it'll probably just take him a, f a, f a few weeks to port all of those other uh, things to to gospel as well. Thanks, Petrus. Great to see you. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so I have uh, the chat is activated. Oh, Andrew Gunner said he has a question. I think we've got time for, for the question. I don't know if you want to type it or ask it. If you want to raise your hand, you can ask in person. Or you can type it. <laughs> but we can wait. I think we have a couple <laughs> of minutes. <laughs> Ah, there we go. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Hi, Andrew. Yeah. Great. Hi. Uh, that, this, is, uh, yeah, this is such an exciting uh, piece of work. I just want to sort of echo what, what Rebecca said and think that the Sadler effect, uh, you know, questions would be 
would be super interesting for the sedimentary basins to try and see what preservation there is over certain timescales and verify that you get the, the scalings you expect. Um, I guess the, the question I have is, is how, is there a way to, to inverse model uh, using this, this frame, like with, with your, with your model, can you do an inverse model that doesn't rely on having the forcings from uh, yeah. the, the mapping and climate, uh, you know, over different time periods? And if, mm -hmm. if you can, or if you can think of a way to do that, can you, can you do this with other planets? Like, could you use the same code to look at Mars, for example? Well, you could use the same code to look at Mars. I mean, I, I, I don't know how in the source code, how easy it would be to say, change the radius and the gravitational constant and so on, but that's probably all you'd have to change. Uh, it's probably a few lines in there. In, in terms of, um, uh, oh, I, I think I lost the other part of the question. I'm sorry, Andrew. <laughs> Uh, no, it's fine. I, yeah, the, yeah, the the other part was just sort of like a, yeah, if the, if you've thought about how to use this to do inverse modeling, if you only have oh, a yes, present state, yes. you can sure. predict things about how it evolved in the past. Sure. Uh, I, yeah. Andrew, I think that's, that's, that's one of the key things here. Uh, and, and it's great that you pointed it out is that ideally you would want to do the inverse. You, you have your sediments and you, you want to see where they, um, have come from and that would actually be a much better way of perhaps reconstructing paleo altimetry right because there's a kind of a mass balance uh, in there of course it becomes more complicated because you need to have uh, very detailed sediment isopacks uh, and also take into account you know things like you know uh, salt versus um uh, pelagic carbonates and, and 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 so on but but it's it's certainly something uh, that that should be done, and and I know I'm I'm running uh, I'm out of time. I just want to quickly uh, a answer Tim's question in the, in the chat. Um, yes, yeah, so you can run finer time steps. There is, uh, I, I think, at the moment, it's the time increment is a hundred thousand years. But you can change that. You know, if you got excited to ten years uh, or whatever, but yeah, it would slow down the model probably a little bit. Yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sabine. Okay, um, brilliant talk. And now I'll pass over to Dina. She's going to introduce our next one.